Hi everyone, and uh, welcome back again to Onco Daily and to uh, Onco Influencers. And uh, today we have a great privilege and honor to host an incredible and amazing uh, woman, um, one of the most famous oncologists globally, and a wonderful physician scientist, Dr. <laughs> Julie Grallo. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Grallo, for having the time for us. Uh, Dr. Grallo is the Chief Medical Officer and Executive Vice President of ASCO, American Society of Clinical Oncology, and brings uh, to her role deep exper uh, expertise in patient care, research, education, and global health. Previously, she was the Jill Bennett Endowed a Professor of Breast Cancer at the University of Washington School of Medicine, Professor in the Clinical Research Division of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, as well as the Director of Breast Medical Oncology at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. Dr. Graulo is strongly committed to advancing equity in cancer care. As the founder of the Women's Empowerment Cancer Advocacy Network, we can. She supports patient advocates in low and middle um, resource countries. In addition, she served as an adjunct professor in the University of Washington's Department of Global Health, as a member of the University of Washington's Breast Cancer Equity Initiative, as medical director for women's cancer-related population health at the University of Washington, and as an advisory council member for the Uganda Cancer Institute's Adult Hematology Oncology Fellowship Training Program. Dr. Grallo received the ASCO Humanitarian Award in 2018 for her work in empowering women cancer patients and survivors globally. This is the short bio for Dr. Grallo. <laughs> it's, it's going to be very good. Otherwise, it would like take hours. She is a recognized leader in breast ca uh, cancer clinical research and has conducted clinical trials in breast cancer prevention, treatment, and survivorship. Dr. Grallo served in leadership roles for the SWOG Cancer Research Network funded by the National Cancer Institute, including as vice chair of the Breast Cancer Committee and executive officer of breast and lung cancer. Before joining ASCO full-time, Dr. Grallo served the society in a variety of volunteer and leadership roles, including chairing the ASCO Academic Global Oncology Task Force, co-chairing the ASCO Resource Stratified Guideline advisory group and serving on the editorial board of the European Society of Medical Oncology, ASCO uh, Global Curriculum in Medical Oncology. She also has been involved with numerous other nonprofit organizations, including Team Survivor, Northwest, and Exercise and Fitness Program for Women Cancer Survivors, which uh, she co-founded in 1995 and serves as team physician a medical advisory committee member for Sierra Sisters African American Support Group, an advisory board member of Global Focus on Cancer, and a board member of Peace Island Medical Center, a rural access hospital in Washington State. Uh, Dr. Grallo received her bachelor's degree from Stanford University and uh, her medical degree from the University of Southern California School of Medicine. She trained in internal medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital at Harvard and completed a medical oncology fellowship at University of Washington Fred Hatch Cancer Research Center in Seattle. Dr. Grallo uh, was among 100 influential women in oncology by Onco Daily as well in 2023. Uh, it's, wow. <laughs> it's long. <laughs> Do we have time left for an interview? <laughs> of course. But if I read your full bio, I've, your full CV, it's going to take days, really. Uh, thank you very much again, Dr. Grallo, for, for being with us and for having the time for, uh, for us. Happy uh, to do it. I, thank you. Uh, I, I know, and I'm going to start from there, I know you were in Antarctica recently. <laughs> I was what in Antarctica, yeah. Um, so we we just went to Antarctica last month. Uh, uh, it was a joint celebration of my husband and my 65th birthday. Um, we try to do something for the milestone birthdays. Um, and uh, for example, for my 50th birthday, I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. For my 60th birthday, a group of us went trekking in Bhutan. So for 65, we went to Antarctica. Uh, it was amazing. It was 
fantastic penguins and icebergs and just fantastic. And it's a good way to kind of realize the beauty of our world and uh, kind of take some time off and reflect and refresh so we can come back and work hard at, you know, improving the lives of, of people with cancer. That's wonderful. I, I was, uh, I mean, I was reading in one of the books, it says every day do something which you are afraid of. Now I I, I need to paraphrase it and to do, do like every, for every your birthday, do something <laughs> which you are afraid of. Uh, or pushes, do something for the first time, you know. Yes. I have a t-shirt that I got when I did my first triathlon that says, when was the last time you did something for the first time? And I, I like that. Yeah. Oh, that's that's nice. That's really nice. Uh you have accomplished so much and you are still so, I mean, and I'm sure you are going to do much more in the coming years and decades. I mean, what's your, what's your recipe of success? What's your, I mean, how you are managing all this? Um, there's no secret sauce. I'll, I'll start with that. Um, and, and think about it. You read a very long bio of accomplishments but I've been doing this for 30 years. So uh, I have I've had many years to have these accomplishments. I think um, if you feel if if you have passion about what you're doing, about your job, and you actually feel that you can make some impact, then it's going to carry you through. Uh, you know, um, if you're in a rut, and you know, you don't, like your job or you feel like you can't possibly make change then you're you're not going to perform so i think having passion and feeling like you can it sometimes it can take a long time and sometimes it's a small impact but i think those are two key things that we don't have total control over but we need to look at those things um in our careers you know uh, because otherwise you're not going to be able to make a difference and you won't be happy yeah that's true um, how is it to be the chief medical officer of ASCO? well i'm Such the second person yeah i'm the second person to serve in that role uh rich Shulsky kind of created the position and uh it's evolved now that i'm in it i think um uh in addition to overseeing, you know, our care delivery department and our policy and advocacy and our center for research and analytics. I've taken the role and taken on uh, what is now our center for global impact, formerly known as our Department of International Affairs, um, and brought my global health hat to it. Our new strategic plan, every five years, the board comes together and we develop a five-year strategic plan. So we, we just launched last year, our next strategic plan. And uh, we put across everything we do, um, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and global impact. So we want that to permeate across everything. You know, we have three main pillars, access, profession, and knowledge, but global impact and equity, diversity, and inclusion should go across all three of those. So that gives us, you know, lots of room, lots of times to think about how we can best serve our members, uh, no matter where they are, to better help them serve uh, and care for their patients. Uh, when when I was reading your bio, and um, I mean, uh, the two, some, some of the most uh, like frequent words I was reading is the global and then equity. Why? what's like what's the role of equity in your career and what it means for you like the equity well um think about all the advances we've made in these 30 years i've been in my career and you know early detection and diagnosis treatment and then survivorship and and palliative care and um it's been huge. And, and I also am a clinical researcher, you know, I've participated in and run clinical trials that have helped make some of those advances. But if they're not available to everybody, you know, the whole equity piece, then what have we done? 
you know, we uh, in the U.S. have our cancer moonshot, moonshot version one. Uh, we're now in in 2.0 uh, was a lot about how do we really advance things? You know, we're shooting for the moon and uh, our colleagues globally uh, in the UK and Europe and globally countered with a ground shot, a cancer ground shot. How do we get everything we already have out to everybody? Because if we could do that, even if we made no further advancement in how we treat cancer um and we do need to make more advancements but you know there are still people who have access to everything who are dying of cancer but if we tomorrow could get access to everything that we know works and is evidence-based and proven we would save hundreds of thousands of lives you know in a year globally so you know i've I first got into global oncology. I did not go through medical school fellowship, really thinking about the global piece. Um, but then very early in my, you know, after I came on faculty, I was invited to serve as a medical oncologist on a Ukraine breast cancer assistance project. And it was um, funded by USAID and um, the Ukrainian Ministry of Health partnered with an NGO called PATH, which used to stand for um, uh, pro- uh, Program for Appropriate Technology and Health, PATH. And now it's just PATH. But uh, they got the money from USAID. And because PATH is based in Seattle, they recruited a crew of breast cancer experts from Seattle and said, this is a three-year project. Would you be willing? Uh, you know, step one is understanding what's going on right now, what they're doing in breast cancer. And then uh, step number two will be to work with our colleagues there to determine, you know, how we can improve that in sustainable ways. It was key because we weren't going to just buy machines or, you know, expensive stuff that would break down eventually it was really sustainability um so that was how i got introduced to it i said sure it was one of those you know what was last time uh, you've done something for the first time i said that sounds interesting i i was not you know involved in global health at the time but i learned a lot quickly um and i learned that going there being there making relationships you know building trust can make strides. Um, I met colleagues, the doctors. We, along with a group in um, Odessa, we did a small preoperative chemotherapy trial um, using full quote-unquote Western doses um, because they reduced all the chemo doses because they felt that Ukrainian women couldn't tolerate Western doses. And so therefore, it didn't work as well. And the surgeons had not really bought in at the time to the benefit of adjuvant chemotherapy. So a, a hidden agenda was showing the surgeons that full doses of chemo can work. So we we did a protocol with just 20 patients with full doses, evidence-based doses. And at the time it was doxorubicin and cyclophosphamide. We didn't even have the taxanes yet. And we saw the tumor shrink, you know, preoperatively and patients who were inoperable became operable. And my Ukrainian colleagues were able to present this at national and regional meetings and talk about the importance of maintaining full dose. And so that was one project that built, you know, a lifelong relationship. But also I met the patient advocates. And that was where I realized um, I could really help get them a voice. They uh, it was the era, if you've ever read um, Solzhenitsyn's Cancer Ward, which was kind of his semi-autobiographical uh, experience with lymphoma. It was the era in the Soviet era where you were taught that you don't give a potentially fatal diagnosis to a patient because they might kill themselves or they'll lose all hope. So you just don't talk about it. So here I was meeting women in cancer hospitals on chemotherapy wards who were not able to talk about their cancer diagnosis or the treatment they were receiving because that was the era 
I mean, think about that. They knew they had cancer. They knew they were getting chemo. And yet some of them were saying, they said, no, I had a really bad infection in my breast, so it needed to be cut off. And then I needed potent antibiotics that were going to cause my hair to fall out. That right there was a project we didn't intend to do going into this Ukraine project. Um, But we saw we can help with the dialogue of how do you talk about a cancer diagnosis. And so we got a few volunteers who were uh, doctors and nurses and patients and got them together and said, we'll help you create maybe some written materials or some talking points and we'll practice and we'll see, does this work for you? So, you know, we had great volunteers who were willing to try to do this and it just took off within, you know, a couple of years there were breast cancer support groups all over the country and they had a permit to march down Krishatik Street, the main street in Kiev, you know, with pink balloons and a marching band to create breast cancer awareness for their daughters, as they said. So seeing how just a little spark of getting them to talk to each other and helping them with some of the language and then letting them take it, because the key is they have to make the changes. We can't go in there and say, here's what you do. It has to be that it comes from the ground. So that was a very long answer to your no, no. <laughs> your question. It's, but it's very that, interesting that, to... Yeah. And so I took a turn that I didn't know was even there in my career, global. Before going to the next uh, question, I, I really want to thank you for the global work you are doing for, uh, in LMICs. For many people, the word global is is a, it has a different meaning. But for you, I mean, I mean, it's it's very usual that we could meet you somewhere I don't know in a very resource limited setting, and then I mean, you you are all everywhere, and like you know, I mean in a real world, what it means, the the global health, and you are doing it for many years. That's why, I mean, I'm thanking you on behalf of many, many other oncologists and patients globally. Well, Uh, well, that's what's nice about my CMO job, my chief medical officer job at ASCO is the the whole time I was on faculty and I'm still professor emeritus in Seattle, I was doing this work, but it was almost more of a hobby. It wasn't the main thing that I was being judged on for promotion, et cetera. It was more of a hobby. I was supported by ASCO in a lot of ways. Um, but um, but then in my ASCO CMO role, it is now part of my job. And that makes it much more fulfilling. I think you and I met a couple times in Armenia. Um, yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. Of course, so. Mm-hmm. And certainly your your visit and your, I mean your interactions here definitely also made huge changes and that's for sure. Uh, well, I was so impressed with you. You had me talk to medical students. You you really pulled together, you know, uh, the a visit that was actually for the Women's Empowerment Cancer Advocacy Network. That second visit, but. Um, I saw your influence in Armenia in education and bringing up the next generation. And that was very impressive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, when you said about the, like in, in resource limited settings, it is, it is very usual and it's very common that like the, the drug dosages can be kind of uh, reformulated or kind of cut down or, I mean, the, the, uh, the protocols are not really the international guidelines are not on in place but and you you were co-chairing the asco resource stratified guidelines committee so i mean in your opinion what's the role of really these guidelines because there, there are two different opinions sometimes about the resource limit no, this resource stratified guidelines many oncologists say this is very good some people but in, in opposite, they say this this guidelines resource stratified guidelines may increase the disparity. So, I mean, what's your opinion? Just like about that, I, I know what's your opinion, but like just for the yeah. For so, this. I think the idea behind trying to create, you know, a more resource stratified, if you will, not everybody likes that term, is to give ideas for where the most value is, where uh, at different 
cost levels almost, if you will. So, you know, the most basic level, this is stuff that, you know, everybody should be able to deliver no matter how constrained your resources are. It's cheap. It's, you know, it's easy to give. But nobody's saying stop there. It's always what's the next step and the next step and the next step. So once you get that, you know, where do you go next? Where a lot of it is, what's the value? Um, How much more efficacy as compared to toxicity and cost are you getting? It is not meant to be a one size fits all at all. I think we put a big disclaimer, you know, in our ASCO resource stratified guidelines saying this is to give you things to discuss with your ministries, with the, whoever's paying for it. You know, we're here and we want to go to the next step. What is a reputable society looking at evidence saying would be the next thing you've had? Because ultimately, I think everybody wants to try to get to a high level. Now, you know, with the Breast Health Global Initiative that Dr. Ben Anderson led and all, we had a maximal level was the highest where we said, actually, a lot of this we're doing in high income countries, but the value isn't that high. So you don't even need to try to get there, you know, but but it, 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 every guideline we make, whether it's, you know, our standard, more higher income tailored guidelines, it's meant to be adapted to the context that's, and the institution and what resources you have. It's It's to show you what's the evidence and then you can use that to tailor your own pathway. So we're encouraging everybody to create their own clinical pathways out of these guidelines. So with that, you know, I have heard, as you said, the criticism that we're supporting substandard care, but we're not at all. We're trying to create a base on which we build and we show the evidence that you can show to your ministries, you know, or, you know, whoever is in charge of paying for drugs or, you know, ex, you know, machines, technology, et cetera, that you can show where the next step should be. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, continuing like what we're talking about, um, it's very common and I'm sure this is very helpful um, in situations when, especially in low middle income countries where the expertise is sometimes is limited and um, so some doctors may not uh, practice the evidence-based medicine or just do not, or some, I mean, some uh, f- so industry somehow kind of in- influence the decisions, not based on the evidence, but rather the, I mean, there is a strong influence from the industry side or some from other like players in the field. So there are some situations when you see, uh, and we, we can see in some countries that, or in some situations when, for example, uh, like the, some of the cheapest essential medications are not available. For example, vincristine, doxorubicin is not available for the patients, but someone who had an influence brought some of the like uh, late, uh, like, new generation medications for very high price, which, mm-hmm. I mean, would not make that sense. So I, I'm, I'm sure that here it's, I mean, these are critically important, especially uh, these recommendations can, can, can make a lot, of, can save a lot of lives and um, by using the resources wisely. Right. Uh, That's what it's all about. That's what the guidelines are all about. We we need, you know, the drugs that are on the World Health Organization's essential medicines list, again, is another source of, you know, independent review looking at value, you know, the toxicity versus the efficacy versus the cost and what other things are required. So for a lot of these newer medicines that you're talking about that are still on patent and very expensive, you need expensive diagnostics as well that can't necessarily be performed. Um, And we've got to figure out how to do the diagnostics. And we are partners in the Union for National Cancer Control's um, ADAM Coalition, the Access to Oncology Medicine Coalition. And, you know, we're looking at getting you know, there'll be a a pilot 
starting probably mostly with breast cancer, but we'll get the drugs on the essential medicines list. But we're talking about, do we add, how do we get some of the newer, still on patent, expensive, targeted therapies on board? And, you know, one place we're looking at is, you know, the immune checkpoint inhibitors. So if we can get some immune checkpoint inhibitors, and, you know, there is one place on the WHO's essential medicines list for metastatic melanoma where um, immune checkpoint inhibitors are there because they're felt to be so high value in a place where other things don't work you, that it's even worth all that cost. But what do you do about how do you select who to give these to? What are the assays? You know, is it pd one testing, tumor mutational burden, you know, microsatellites? But how do you get all that done and select the right patient so you're not overusing them, right? And then how do you monitor the toxicities? Because that's something that, you know, it's if something starts to happen, an autoimmune kind of, you know, response yeah. that you turn on, you have to react immediately, stop the drug, frequently admit the patient, start steroids. None of that is expensive in the big scheme of things, but it requires really high level training Expertise. of the nurses and the doctors and listening to the patients and the patients understanding if you have these symptoms, get right in because if you let it go. So the managing the toxicities is something that we're really talking about. And uh, with UICC and the Adam coalition, and we'll have a little round table at the ASCO annual meeting on how can we best support getting immune checkpoint inhibitors in at the whole spectrum of the diagnostics, the delivery, and then the management of toxicities? Uh, talking about the medications, and this is like some of my wounds, and I always talk about this, <laughs> about the the medications and about the access, about the availability. But one thing I I think we are missing, and I don't know how to, I mean, uh, how we can tackle this globally, is the quality as well. So imagine we have an access to any, I mean, uh, checkpoint inhibitors, but, or like small molecules, any, or like even essential medications but we don't know what's the quality. So that it does not, I mean, it does not make the, the medication available, right? Yeah. Or accessible. And you question it. And uh, so- I don't know how, um, how we are going to solve it globally. I know well, this I, exists also, I mean, in different countries, not only just LMICs. Absolutely. And um, we've been having lots of dialogue on this related to our recent drug shortages in the United States of carboplatin and cisplatin. And in the U.S., uh, the FDA's primary job is to protect the patient, right? That's the safety, right? And to prove there's efficacy and, you know, to protect uh, the patient. And I think, you know, with our U.S. FDA, we trust the quality of the drugs that come into the country because we do audits of who's making it. But most of the manufacture of these off patent, cheap generic drugs is now in China and India. Um, and while we do have FDA approval for certain manufacturers and certain, you know, the whole act of pharmaceutical ingredients, the basic ingredients that go into the manufacturing too. Um, I think there are other manufacturers that just don't have the quality. They're not investing, you know, in the delivery line. They, it might not be the right doses. I don't know. There are very good quality coming out of these countries, but you've, I understand what you're saying and what most countries don't have that ability quality control. to do the audits and the quality control. And I think that might be, you know, where there's room for some regional, like, you know, the European Union came together with the EMA, right? And so they're overseeing it. Like, I don't think it, I, I know that, you know, most countries have an FDA equivalent, if you will, but they don't have the, the same money, the same capacity. authority, the same power. Right. So that might be a real role for a more regional. I think, you know, with all of, with our recent drug shortages for carbo and cisplatin, and we've, we have other drug shortages, just, you know, it's all about 
the quality of the manufacturers. We've driven up down the price of some of these drugs below the point that you could make it in the U.S. or in a higher income setting or even in a high quality plant in a lower resource setting, you know, because it, it to have a reliable, you know, manufacturing line that doesn't break down, you have to replace the equipment. There's that kind of quality too. Even if what comes out is high quality, you want quality of the manufacturing facility so it doesn't break down and lead to a shortage. So I think some of the drug shortage work we're doing will lead to more dialogue around how do we bolster, how do we improve the manufacturing of the raw materials and the end product around the world, wherever it is, and try to gain some incentives for the quality of the manufacturing as well as the quality of the drug. So it's a problem. I understand it. And the temptation is to always buy the lowest price, right? But um, we're talking about how do we have incentives where we actually base what we're reimbursed, what we pay on you know, a quality metric. The FDA's got a pilot that they're working on. It's totally voluntary now, but how do we rate the quality, not necessarily of the drug, which is more what you're getting at, but of the manufacturing plant, which in the end relates to the quality of the drug. Uh, so more to come on that. <laughs> yeah. Come, coming to the other extremity, um, talking about drugs. Um like when I listen to the, let's say, lectures or interviews of those pioneers from back 60s, 70s, cancer pioneer giants of cancer care, and like, for example, Emir Freireich and others, one thing um, was, I mean, and I memorized that they were saying that if the current reg regulations existed back that time, we would not have these developments what we have right now and we would never be able to to like cure cancer uh what do you think right now um how we can make the processes more faster when we see in the clinic in, in the clinical trials that a drug is working should we wait all these the faces and uh I mean to get to get this when we are talking about like deadly diseases, people are dying. How, right. how I mean we can kind of balance these two extremities to ensure that the patients are safe, but in the meantime, to not hold the medications which can save lives in our uh, shelves. How how we can balance this? What what can we do? Well. Um... And that gets somewhat to the regulatory authority uh, um, committing to get drugs, especially for patients that don't have other options and have serious diseases to patients sooner. I, I think our FDA has done a great job, uh, you know, with accelerated approvals, um, which aren't full approvals. You have to finish the work and do the randomized phase three study or whatever, but you can get it sooner. There, so there's the issue in the U.S. of is there an FDA approval, but then also, um, you know, will the payer pay for it? So you get now we have all of these drugs that are increasingly tumor agnostic, right? So they work in everybody that has a HER2 positive or, you know, an ALK mutation or whatever. But they might work a little differently across the tumor type. So you've got to study it. But they, for the most part, work. One thing that um, my predecessor in this ASCO CMO role, Rich Shulsky, started the TAPER trial, which is a targeted agent um, uh, utilization registry. And um, so basically, we took... So this is getting the data. It's not going to lead to FDA approvals everywhere, but it will lead to the data where we can go to the payers and say, hey, look, this patient has this. We have a study that shows it works here. So it takes targeted agents that are approved for some indication um, and studies it outside of that indication. So if it's approved in lung cancer for EGFR, you know, then let's test it in other cancer types that have 
overexpression of EGFR or whatever. And so there's a whole bunch of cohorts going on, different drugs, different targets, you know, different tumor types. And when we we get a result, there's a lot of statistics working on when do you expand a cohort, when do you shut it down and all. We we publish it. So um so then there's data out there that you know the FDA can't review all these little approvals and it's not worth the company's it costs a lot of money to get it to expand your label, et cetera. But we gather the evidence that would then support getting it to the patient. So that's one model, especially in this era of targeted therapies, where um, we're getting some tumor agnostic approvals, you know, where if as long as you have this mutation, doesn't matter what kind of cancer you have, you can use the drug. Um, but uh, we need the evidence that shows that that presence of that mutation or alteration or overexpression, whatever it is, um, actually is the same across cancer types too. So we're trying innovative models of trials. And and I do think the FDA, this whole accelerated approval, I mean, they're trying to push for a phase two trial that um, is designed for an accelerated approval. So a randomized phase two that then... Um, uh, you can get your accelerated approval if positive based on a phase two kind of number of patients, but then it, it expands into the phase three with the more definitive evidence that would lock in your approval. That kind of design smart trials up front. Um, and so you can get an early approval if you have a promising drug with an early win, and then you expand out to get your complete approval. I think the key though is... You know, with chemotherapy, we we understood, as you talk about our giants, uh, our forefathers, you know, who were starting oncology, really, to maximum tolerated dose, right? And chemo, that makes sense. You know, chemo works by interfering with cell division in some way, shape, or form. And cells that are dividing the fastest will be the most impacted. And those are usually cancer cells, but that's why normal cells also have side effects from it. So MTD, maximum tolerated dose, made sense for chemo. It does not necessarily make sense for these targeted agents or for immunotherapy for that matter. You know, you can have good effect at a much lower dose that's not impacting the normal tissues. And so we have all these drugs approved based on MTD where it doesn't make sense. And so now FDA has come up with Project Optimus to try to get the optimal dose before you get approval. But we also are working on drugs that are already approved at our what are probably way too high a dose and there's efficacy and trying to define the right dose. So in immunotherapy, we talked about trying to get that into LMICs. Um, you know, we have some data that longer intervals between treatment, lower doses might be very effective, you know, in certain types of cancer. We should be exploring that. We should be doing those kinds of trials. Who's going to pay for it? That's not likely to come from industry. They've got their approval. They've got their dose, et cetera. But that's where, you know, for example, in the U.S., our National Cancer Institute would come in or foundations, uh, you know, would pay for that kind of trial. Uh, we at ASCO, our second trial, and this is the one I started after Dr. Shilsky started the TAPER trial, we uh, we are will this year in 2024 launch this trial, but we got funding from something that, that kind of came from our Affordable Care Act called PCORI, the Patient Centered Comparative Outcomes Research Institute. So it's federal money. It's not really from the NIH or NCI, but it's to focus on patient centered kind of research in health. It's not cancer specific, but we got a big award, $11 million, to do a trial looking at CDK4-6 inhibitors use in patients with metastatic breast cancer who are older, 65 or older. So we know in that population that many of our providers are starting at a lower dose because the, their patients won't tolerate. They want the patient to be able to stand. We know that even if they start at a higher dose, many of them have doses reduced. We know in clinical trials that those who have dose reductions don't do differently than those who have the high dose. So the trial we're doing is 
a, a simple trial of start at the FDA approved dose, but then, you know, de um, decrease the dose as not tolerated. And a lot of people will have their dose decreased versus start at the lower dose and then increase if tolerated. And then you get to the long-term dose because many of these patients live for years and years and years on these drugs. These are really combined with endocrine therapy, you know, great drugs that ex really extend, you know, you want the best quality of life. So what you're gonna do is you're trying to find the dose that they're gonna be able to stay on long-term. And so this is our randomized trial of just start low or start high and then move to the point where the patient's going to be able to tolerate it. That those These are the kinds of trials we have to do after the fact because the drug likely got approved at too high a dose where many people can't tolerate it. That's going to really help as these drugs become available in lower resource settings, you know, is, you know, you don't, you can't manage all the toxicities as well. You, you know, I mean, the neutropenia that you get from these drugs is, is real. So let's define a right dose. Uh, thank you. So uh, what's the most important in, in oncology for you? Ah, what's the most important? That's well, well, let's go back to the, the beginning of our conversation. I think it's, equitable access to care and clinical trials is what I really promote, um, the equity piece. Oh, thank you. Uh, and what about the, I mean, what's the role of mentorship in your opinion? In ah, um, Well, that's my um, whole job now. <laughs> At this point I in know, my that's career. That's why I'm asking that question to you. <laughs> <laughs> At this point in my career, you know, uh, it is critical that I and my team are working on, you know, bringing up, you know, the next generation who are going to be the leaders of the future and supporting them and giving them the skills and the tools, but also not being locked into, well, this is the way I did it or whatever, but, you know, allowing some alternative pathways or ideas or, you know, stimulating innovation. Um, so I view the biggest part of my job is I'm less a formal mentor anymore because I'm not on faculty, you know, and there's so many people, but, you know, the whole sponsorship, finding opportunities, you know, for, you know, that can help grow the careers or allyship, you know, supporting uh, the younger generation, you know, you've been a recipient and then you oversaw our ASCO IDEA awards, Yes. You know, our International Development and Education Awards, you know, and you chaired that idea committee. Um, that's part of what we have to do. And, um, you know, that so and I'm also I can be a good introducer, a convener. I can bring together people. And, you know, I know a lot of people in a lot of places and a lot of roles. And so, you know, that's what I feel if it really comes down to what's the most important thing I'm doing at this point in my career. It's really supporting, you know, the the bright young minds uh, and helping them take over my role. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. And uh, I want to thank also the ASCO for, I mean, whenever someone is talking about the idea or the educational programs of ASCO, I mean, they are, the first word comes to me, it's uh, thank you, because, I mean, it really shaped my personal and professional life, certainly, and I'm sure for many, many other people as well. Uh, a few more questions, just um, how you how you find the work life balance? I, I know it is a very popular question. People like to ask it, but really, because I mean, you are everywhere. You are traveling between the Seattle and DC. Then you, I mean, we can see you. No, no, Ukraine, Armenia, Europe, Antarctica now already. <laughs> um, I think uh, that's something that we all have to figure out separately, um, and. Uh, you know, I have been very well supported by my husband, who I met in college, and we've gone, you know, to med school and residency and all of that together. Um, so we have, I have a good partnership uh, there. Um, I think, uh, you know, block out time uh, to be 
offline as much as possible and just be enjoying, um, you know, the family, you know, the surroundings. I, I like being outdoors and taking hikes and, you know, being out in, in nature, you know, climbing mountains, you know, running, but just even just a gentle hike out. I'm very fortunate to live in a beautiful part of the world where I can do that and get outdoors and, you know, going for, you know, an hour or two long hike and just relaxing your mind. That's where I come up. So you you ask if that's really work-life balance, but that's where I come up with some of my best ideas for how to solve a problem at work too. It's just freeing up your mind, you know, or you're in all this beauty and you're not stressed with all the different emails you're getting and, you know, Zoom calls you have and everything and just give give yourself some time to just relax. And, I, you know, we do take our vacations. When I went to Antarctica, you know, um, it, you know, I was mostly disconnected not 100 percent, but um you know and just enjoying the, the beauty of our world so um also relationships are part of the work-life balance you know i told you for my 50th birthday i climbed mount kilimanjaro i did that with um six other women friends three of us turned 50 on the mountain you know i've got this core uh you know so of people, friends who were just there for each other and women supporting women and friends and, you know, not just women, but, you know, men friends too. But, but that's really fun. Um, So on Antarctica, we went with another couple who somebody I've known for 30 years will support each other doing anything. And it's crazy. And we give each other opportunities and all. So um, I think, a strong friend network, uh, you know, strong family, close relationships, taking some time off. And then when you're working, you can really work hard and put your yourself into it. I don't know. It's it's easier to say uh, than do, I think. And being able to say no is something I've learned a little bit more over the years. I didn't say no a lot early on. And so being smarter about when to say yes and when to say no. And sometimes you need some help. You need somebody to bounce this off of, you know. Uh, what's If it's not secret, what's the next destina- uh, destination for the next anniversary? Ah, well, the older you get, the more frequent you have miles. Frequently you have milestones, <laughs> right? Because you want to make sure you make it. Um, I think... Uh, Galapagos, uh, probably <clears throat> haven't been there. Um, nobody will ever invite me to give a talk there. So that's also the thing I look at when we look for our destination <laughs> for our milestones. So probably Galapagos and we'll, uh, we'll do that for our 40th wedding anniversary, probably, which oh, is so nice. coming. Yeah. I hope someone from the islands uh, here uh, will hear us and we'll invite also for the talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And to the last question, one of my one friends who is a writer, he, he was telling me if we, if we take a blank page, one page, that would be enough. I mean, if we'd like to like just put down the, the memories we have for all our, our life. Uh, I mean, is there anything specific you would like, I mean, interesting or something specific you would like to share from your memories you would put on, on a blank page? Um, you know, I it would be very hard to narrow it down from a whole thick book uh, for me because I just have so many amazing experiences. I take a lot of pictures and it's very fun to be able to go back and and just look at and and you know remember some of those very fun times all the work we did with the women's empowerment cancer advocacy network which started in eastern europe and central asia i think we did it in about 12 countries in eastern europe central asia one of them armenia um, which started from the ukraine project but then getting invited to do a version in sub-saharan africa by the ugandan women cancer support organization and then now we've done it in about 10 countries there 
every single one of those, I think back at just the relationships and the culture and the fun and bringing all these countries together and talking about difficult topics. You know, how do we we focus on breast and cervical cancer and how can create awareness and get better care and all. But then the downtime is also equally important at those, you know, the dancing and the, you know, the, the socializing and, you know, all of those relationships that are built. I mean, it's so fun for me to go on to Twitter X, whatever it is now and, and LinkedIn and have all of these people from around the world who I know well, and we're like, all supporting each other too and bump into each other you know around the world so that's probably what i would put if i get one page it would be thinking about the weekend meetings in eastern europe and central asia and then in east and southern africa and all of those relationships that continue and you know the 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 good work and sadly those who we've lost because these are breast and cervical cancer patients. And that's what stimulates me to know that we have to keep doing this and we need to do better. Thank you so much. This was an amazing like experience for me listening your, uh, <laughs> your uh, thoughts and ideas and your reflections on different topics. And I'm sure everyone who is going to watch it is going to, enjoy it as well. Thank you very much for all the work you are doing, all the support you are giving to the uh, to different countries globally, to young generations, like young oncologists, young and senior oncologists, and uh, <laughs> most importantly, also to the patients. Thank you very much for everything. Thanks for having me, Gaborg. Next time I'll interview you <laughs> and we'll see, <laughs> we'll talk about all your accomplishments and successes. Oh, thank you.